Hi everybody, welcome to week three. So week three is the end of unit one and summer is progressing. Um, so as I'm getting into this slide, what I wanna tell you right off the bat, if you've looked at Canvas and the syllabus, this week I'm asking you to do a journal, a journal um, which is really a short essay. And so I will provide that link on Canvas for you to comment there in your journal. Um, so right off the bat, a lot of people ask me how long should the journal be? I really don't prescribe number of words standards. What I will tell you is for the question I ask you, if you're writing less than a couple hundred words, you probably haven't covered it. Um, if you're writing more than a couple thousand words, you've probably covered it adequately. <laughs> um, so somewhere in there, um, Typically, a, a good journal is probably going to be about 500, 700 words, something like that. But I really don't count words. I really want to see if you're just covering the, the question that I pose to you. So no discussion this week, just the journal. So that means after I give you this short lecture, half hour or so, um, you are free to do the readings that I assign, a couple from the text itself, and then a couple other additional readings, um, which aren't necessarily easy, so you might have to read them a couple of times, but they're important. They're important for a couple of reasons, and I want to hit that right off, right off the bat, why I, I cover those readings. Um, from the text, we're talking about the nature of federalism and some of the metaphors for federalism. Um, the, the two journal articles that I included are both from a, uh, a journal called Publius, the Journal of Federalism, and they typically um, talk about, they have annual at least, articles where they talk about the state of federalism. And these are two of those, one's from 2013, right after President Obama got elected for the second term and one's from 2017 when President Trump got elected. Um, so they, the, and their whole series of articles really kind of follows that theme too. Uh, so the, the question is, does federalism change with presidential administrations? Why or why not? Um, and what kinds of things do change? So it's interesting to look at those two articles and look at the contrasts and, and similarities. So I'm gonna be asking you in the journal to comment on the state of federalism as you understand it today in 2018. So that's the purpose of those articles. So let me move into the subject matter for this week. And then as you read, do the readings, I, I think it will become a good exercise for you to do the journal and comment on these things. So from the Goldshauser and Rose article, um, they talk in the end, or about the middle section towards the end, um, several policy areas of interest. And these policy areas of interest really serve as springboards to talk about the state of federalism. So let's think about some of these policy areas of interest for just a second, and I really want you to read the article. But healthcare, uh, more specifically insurance, which the Affordable Care Act really had a lot of stuff packed into it, um, much of which had to do with uh, obtaining health insurance for everyone. Um, so what is the state of the Affordable Care Act? Actually, it's kind of confusing right now, isn't it? It's not fully repealed. It's not really fully in effect. Um, it never was, or almost never was fully in effect after the court decision that threw out um, the employer mandate and also said that states don't have to do Medicaid expansion. So right now we have a, kind of a confusing state of Medicaid in states. In some states we have expansion. In some states we have waivers so that they can pursue their own kind of program. In some states we have traditional Medicaid. So the issue is that Medicaid varies state to state, depending on what they've adopted. How about the issue of immigration? What is the status of so-called sanctuary cities and even actually sanctuary states? And the issue of, without that emotional term being attached, uneven enforcement of federal 
immigration law as it regards persons who are in the United States undocumented. Um, what about state lawsuits regarding the so-called travel ban, which actually is still being adjudicated, as you know. Um, marijuana. We have a current administration that has renewed the emphasis um, through the Department of Justice to enforce federal laws on controlled substances regarding marijuana. Uh, the previous administration, the Obama administration, was not that interested in enforcing those laws that stringently. Although, I say that, the, the fact of the matter is the so-called war on drugs has been going on uh, since you know the Nixon administration through Democratic and Republican administrations. Um, and the Obama administration really was no exception, um, you know, including some of the actions we've taken vis-a-vis -vis, uh, law enforcement uh, and actions with our partner nations in Latin America. But now several states, I think about eight, have legalized either medical or recreational use of marijuana or both those things. And so how does that affect federalism? For example, Nebraska sued Colorado because Nebraska said that, uh, especially in the western part of the states, the western part of the state of Nebraska, where the counties are uh, kind of s small population and small sheriff's departments, that the fact that Colorado uh, legalized purchase of marijuana made law enforcement uh, onerous in those western counties. Um, so what is the federal relationship to state relationship on marijuana? Education. You know that during the Obama administration, the uh, Obama signature law called Every Student Succeeds was passed, which supplanted the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, and really, interestingly enough, Every Student Succeeds actually gave more power back to the states which is a little bit counterintuitive because No Child Left Behind was passed under a Republican administration and states complained it took away educational authority from them. Every Student Succeeds gave a little more power back to states. But what is um, the emphasis on education in the United States and what of continued changes to the Department of Education? Uh, energy and the environment. You know that the Trump administration reversed the Obama administration on the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota Access pipeline. Um, the Trump administration is beginning to reverse the clean power plan. And actually, some of that, as reported in the media, is a little bit overstated. Actually, what the Trump administration is doing is saying that they're going to review those regulations. They're not fully thrown out yet. Um, but now we have mixed messages on renewables. Are we, you know, were we fighting a war on coal and hence uh, coal is the good guy and renewables are the bad guys? I don't know. Um, what I would comment, what I would opine there is that if coal suffered in popularity, part of that's due to the market, that renewables have become more affordable for utilities to use that the technology now exists for individual consumers to actually begin to use renewables. Uh, California, you might know, has a law right now that all new construction of houses has to have solar panels installed so that consumers, that is individual electric consumers, can actually generate some of their own power. But we have a lot of mixed messages on renewables, right? In the Midwest, uh, we say that using ethanol gasoline, which is 10 to 15 percent produced from ethanol, corn ethanol, is a good thing um, because it it uh, reduces our dependence on oil sources from foreign nations. But is it really efficient? Um, there's other issues. We know that same-sex marriage has was. Uh, declared legal by the Supreme Court, but now we see that states, some states, have started to change their laws regarding marriage um, in perhaps an attempt to limit 
the effectiveness of that decision legalizing same-sex marriage um, you could say you could make the argument that states have done the same thing regarding abortion many states have um, but the point is that the laws again are uneven state to state currently uh, how will states react to changes in trade you know if we have a trade war with China for example how will that affect agricultural states like the state I happen to be sitting in in Nebraska the price of soybeans and meat products and corn so there's a lot of conflict between state governments and the national government and they end up being manifest through some policy areas and so the question is as this bowling and pickerel article asked the 2013 article is federalism fragmented so this article as well as the Goldshauser and Rose article point to the specter of partisanship so we can all talk about partisanship and what a bad thing it is but I mean <laughs> kind of the rhetorical question is if partisanship is a bad thing um, isn't it just a natural thing that's that's a question I'm gonna pose in a couple slides um, so they talk about uh, and with in these two articles I, I draw out some of these points partisanship within national parties right so we know that the national parties regularly spend time battling each other and trying to convince the American public why they are on the side of right and truth and the other party is on the side of wrong and lies um, we have partisanship within state parties now there was a point in time when the the philosophies of state parties say the state Democratic Party versus the National Democratic Party there were differences you can still see those differences however those differences are blurring um, those differences are becoming less distinct um, we have partisanship uh, practiced when parties in charge at state levels um, practice policy making or policy protest through official means such as attorneys general suing the national government this has been done by uh, Republican Republican controlled states suing the national government this has been done by democratically controlled states suing the national government we see partisanship and interest group pluralism which is discussed in a couple of the articles um, interest groups practice a particular form of partisanship that spans the boundaries presented to us by by our political divisions of states and cities and the national geographic area right um, for example our current debate on gun control is probably a debate that spans political boundaries we have partisanship as exacerbated by national level media so um, the media are primarily located at national targets national audiences I should say um, so we can all sit down each night and watch Fox News or we can watch MSNBC or we can watch CNN or we can watch PBS NewsHour or we might listen to NPR and not list, watch any of those cable networks at all or we could read the New York Times but the point is that a lot of media the, the emphasis is national level politics and so I would contend what that does is it tends to it 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 tends to disguise issues that are happening at the state level so at the state level there are policy areas that we worry about that the governors worry about that the state legislatures worry about that city councils worry about but we don't hear much about them we hear nothing about them really on national media we have to we have to be attuned to local media local newspapers or local uh, TV stations and local TV stations tend to emphasize what the weather is going to be tomorrow they spend about half their broadcast talking about the weather so I would contend that partisanship is somewhat exacerbated by national level media um, especially their their primetime 
shows where they feature a lot of talking heads either yelling at each other or affirming what you already believe, depending on the network you watch. So all this kind of begs the question, which is what I was asking you about Federalist Papers number 45 and 46, um, are individual states as unique as Madison might have wanted us to understand? Do citizens necessarily identify more with their states versus some kind of national identity? I mean, am I, and I, am I a Nebraskan or am I an American? I mean, I happen to live in Nebraska because I was born here. My parents were both born here. My ancestors were homesteaders in Nebraska. I have a little bit of a Nebraska identity. You know, I wouldn't have gone to university hadn't it been for the Land Grant Act because the University of Nebraska wouldn't have existed. So I can trace that back. But I can also tell you that I served in the military 26 years, so I really identify myself as an American. Um, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily identify themselves with their state, but maybe they do. Madison was arguing that that affiliation was stronger, but is it? And a, another question that gets begged is how do states actually exercise their sovereignty, if that indeed is an accurate word? Is there such a thing as state sovereignty? I'll just leave it at that. And do Supreme Court decisions contribute to fragmentation by issuing rulings that sometimes support state independence and sometimes support federal preemption of state laws. Is that confusion frustrating for people who are trying to make policy? So here's a couple thoughts from last week when you were discussing, uh, in your two groups, you were discussing Federalist Papers number 45 and 46, but I also had you read Federalist number 10. And in in uh, Federalist 10, which is famous, what, what did Madison really mean by faction? He talked about faction, right? Did he mean political parties, which actually existed in a de facto way and, and soon after the Constitution was ratified, they became manifest? Um, and he, maybe he was just ignoring the fact that political parties actually existed because he doesn't mention them. Washington famously warned against them in his farewell address, but by that time, the parties were already taking shape. So did he mean political parties or did he mean regional differences as in the North versus the South at that time? That is the states that advocated the continuance of slavery as an institution versus the states that uh, said either officially that it was immoral uh, or they just said, look, this can't continue. Um, was it manufacturing versus agricultural? Were those some of the factions? And you could actually extend that list. You know, was it those who supported settling the Eastern seaboard as it existed versus those who supported, you know, pushing West? Um, and so what does the structure say about faction? How were the officials of the national government actually elected or selected? Does the structure have something to say about how the founders viewed the people, viewed factions? Um, in actuality, they were they were striving for balance, right? A House of Representatives represented the people, which could be seen as advocating the particular passions of the moment. But uh, the Senate was seen as being a little more stable with its six year terms being selected by state legislatures. I mean, the question is, is that really the, the continued state as Madison advocated it? Um, that's a question that you should come to grips with. And so then finally, I had you look at numbers 45 and 46. Um, you know, do citizens actually feel more affinity to their state or to the nation? Um, the interesting part, especially in 46, um, what was the national army to state militia relationship? And did Madison really expect that state militias would repel an invasion from the national army? That's a great question. I mean, I'm, I don't know if he really thought that. I don't know if he didn't. Um, but it's a really interesting concept. Um, and so what is our political identity and relationship with this institution we call federalism? 
Uh, American federalism was invented by the founders, by Madison, Hamilton, and others at the at the Constitutional Convention. It was invented by them. And so what is our political identity and relationship with that institution? So I want to spend the rest of the lecture kind of talking about some of these models of intergovernmental relations. This is from a book by Deli Wright um, in 1988 called Understanding Intergovernmental Relations. So some of this should be familiar to you, I think. Um, this is the basic model, which I really like, these, inter these circles and how they represent the, st the local, the state, and the national levels of government. So he says you could model uh, federalism by three designations, coordinate, overlapping, or inclusive. And that each of these designations have a particular relationship and they have a particular authority pattern. So the one on the left is called the coordinate relationship. That means what it says that the national and the state and local levels coordinate with each other. The relationship is one of independence. So we see a national level government in the big circle, and then we see a state level government in the smaller circle with the local government subsumed under the state because it is a creature of the state. So the relationship is one of independence and the authority pattern is one of autonomy. That is, the state doesn't have to ask permission of the national government to do something. The local government has to ask some permission of the state to do some things but the states may delegate some powers to the cities and to localities. So that's the coordinate designation. The overlapping um, designation is just what it looks like. There, there are three circles, the national, the state, and the local government. And they all intersect at various levels. So there are national to state issues. There are state to local issues. There are local to national issues. There's three interlocking circles. So the relationship is one of interdependence and the authority pattern actually becomes one of bargaining. And so we can actually see this happening as well. So think of grants that come to cities. Cities bargain in a sense for some grants by presenting a winning package to national level governments or the national level government to get grant money. Sometimes that grant money is automatic depending on, for example, the size of the city. Um, but there is a bargaining relationship. And then we have this inclusive designation. Uh, and it is clearly, let me go to the authority pattern, is clearly designated as a hierarchy, right? The local is, is a creature of the state, the state is a creature of the national government, and the relationship is one of dependence. That is, that the local the lower levels of government depend on the higher levels of government for their existence uh, and for their sustenance. Um, so in that coordinate authority model, I just want to highlight one thing, this thing called Dillon's rule. Um, you know, Dillon's rule was based on a case in the 1800s by a judge in Iowa. Um, basically what Dillon's rule says, and most of you know this, is that local entities are creatures of the state. That means that states write the laws for their cities. This, cities, localities, localities are not uh, included in the Constitution. You might know that. States and the national government are included in the Constitution. So what's the status of cities? The status of cities really is that they are subordinate to states. There's a lot of controversy on that because the power, uh, the political power in some states really resides at city level. And so um, can the states really exist without the cities and can the cities exist without the state? In the overlapping model, um, we there is this implication that there's a hierarchy with the national government at the top. And so if you think of the relationship in this term, um, this tends to treat states as administrative districts in the larger governmental scheme. In fact, there are federal states or federal nations, I should say, that are organized this way. 
where it's written in the Constitution, where clearly the state or province is subordinate to the national government. Our Constitution is written in a somewhat more confusing way. But, you know, a lot of people see this as the model, right? That states have authority only as granted to them by the national government. And in the overlapping ind independent model, which is those interlocking circles, um, there are substantial areas of government operations that involve all three areas simultaneously, right? Uh, for example, public housing. Think of Section 8, which is rent assistance. Um, that is a national government program using national government money, except that housing offices, they are local offices. So the Omaha Housing Authority is a local office. Some of the board members are appointed by the mayor and council. They operate within the city of Omaha, but they use federal money to do so. They're carrying out a federal program on behalf of all three levels of government. Um, you can think of other programs where the responsibilities, the administration and the funding all overlap. And that's really important um, because money and responsibilities also, also relate to power. So who's really in charge of some programs? And that's really an important question going forward. So um, not to insult your intelligence, but you hear these a lot, right? Layer cake federalism, uh, marble cake federalism. There they are. The simplest model would be layer cake federalism, right? That's supposedly what the founders designed, that there were three levels of government, three or four levels of government, although the Constitution only mentions two. You have the national government, state governments, uh, and then you have county and municipal governments, right? So these are layers. They each have responsibilities, but they blend nicely together in this nice looking cake, which is tasty and good. Um, but really it doesn't work that way. Uh, so somebody came up with marble cake federalism where everything is sort of blended together in this nice looking marble cake and, and the layers work nicely together. And then some people came up with crumb cake, I, I guess it's called, um, you know, where everything's all jumbled up together. Um, so those are the cake models. They're useful to an extent to try to explain federalism. And then there's this idea of picket fence federalism. So what's this picket fence federalism? So think of a picket fence in a front yard and each of the pickets is a different policy area, but they overlap national, state, and local levels. So each of the support members, those horizontal members, they partially support that policy area. So think of education. Education really, most of the funding for education comes at the state level. But in some states, many states, including Nebraska, a very large portion of the, of the funding comes really from the local level, and that is in the form of property taxes. And states have worked hard to try to equalize property taxes to try to do away with the specter of very rich districts and very poor districts based on property tax within the state. Well, we still have those things, um, but states attempt to equalize that funding, but that causes a lot of consternation at the state level. But if you just follow the funding, you would say that uh, schools, public schools are probably a local responsibility uh, with a lot of state input. But there is a lot of national emphasis on education, and this didn't just start recently. It started really with a with about the um, if we're talking about K-12 education in the 50s with the Eisenhower administration. Uh, really, if you talk about higher education, the Land Grant Act, which I previously mentioned uh, in 1862, formed a lot of state universities. So the national government has been involved in education for well over 100 years. Um, but to what extent? So the point is that you can see through this picket and you can try to somehow discern the level of involvement from each level of government. The fence wouldn't stand up without all three levels of government, but that doesn't make the relationship um, necessarily 
cooperative. I throw this in here because this is in your text and I'm throwing this in here because of what I'd like you to do is spend some time looking at this table in the text because it's really it's it's really important just going down the left hand column um, the point that is is attempted to be made here is that we've sort of gone through an evolution in the the kind of federalism we've experienced in this country from conf conflict federalism which is maybe what the constitution set up through cooperative concentrated creative competitive and calculative and maybe we're in some kind of different federalism today. What I'd like you to do, and I'm not gonna talk about every block in this table, because I'd like you to read that article and study this table, because it gives you some ideas for writing your journal uh, on the state of federalism. How, how do the states and the national government define the terms of their relationship? That's the important part about this table. So I'm not going to belabor it. I just would like you to spend some time with it. And so finally in your text, we have this, um, these models of federalism based on terms of geology, right? And kinds of rocks, sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous rocks, right? So sedimentary rocks are like sandstone. They're formed by compression of sedimentary materials. There's a lot of sandstone in the Midwest from alluvial flooding that gets compressed over time. Um, then metamorphic rock is rock that actually changes, hence the word metamorphic. Um, that would be like marble. Great compression uh, on sedimentary rock actually changes the composition of the rock, makes it more permanent. And then igneous rock really comes from uh, seismic and volcanic activity. Uh, so over time, the the lava that that is that comes from volcanoes can actually become granite. So, um, so hence my <laughs> knowledge of geology there. But anyway, sedimentary the the federalism we see in evidence is really a result of the layering of decisions over time. We've built sediment, right? Um, and so we can see some attributes of dual federalism or conflict federalism in certain areas such as budgeting, K-12 education and defense, right? So we've just accepted that K-12 education is a state responsibility, but we've built in some federal supports for it. And But by now we sort of have accepted a system where most of the support comes from the state level, even though that may or may not be efficient. Um, metamorphic, re, you know, refers to changes in the kind of federalism due to pressure and other forces. So environmental law really has morphed from a local and state concern to a national concern. Why? Because during the westward push and the founding of the nation, water rights and uh, care of the environment really belonged to the states and the people who were settling that land, right? Well. Um, over time, we began to see and believe and know scientifically that air doesn't confine itself to one state, water doesn't confine itself to one state. So for polluting water and air in one state, it has downstream effects, obviously. If we're dumping raw sewage into the Missouri River in Omaha, Nebraska, it has a downstream effect for every other locality downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. And so that really is the, the genesis of national environmental laws. Um, and then igneous really compares to seismic events that change the nature of federalism. So really the Civil War uh, really did change, start to change the nature of federalism. It was during the Civil War that the Land Grant Act was passed and the Homestead Act was passed and the Trans-Pacific Railway Act was passed. Those three acts did change the nature of federalism. It was during that war that the United States Department of Agriculture was formed. Um, it was just after that war that the Interstate Commerce Commission was formed by Congress. And so that war really was a seismic event that changed more than uh, 
just you know slavery doing away with slavery but it actually changed the nature of the relationship between states and the national government the new deal obviously changed the nature of the relationship between states and the national government social security was an interesting change because in fact many states had some form of their own social security but the roosevelt administration made social security a national program that's one of the prime examples the great society programs of the johnson administration were something of a seismic event in changing the nature of health care how does the national government relate to citizens in this case um, in terms of the kinds of health care that citizens expect medicare and medicaid were part of the great society programs those are programs that um, actually have some state involvement in them as well so finally after all that babbling um, i want you to do the readings as i suggested and what we're going to do this week again do by uh saturday june 2nd um it's already june see time's flying um what i want you to do is given your understanding of federalism including the readings we've included up to now please comment on the current state of federalism in the united states as you understand it i don't think you're constitutional scholars neither am i but i'd like to hear your thoughts on the current state of federalism and then i gave you some questions there to guide your thinking um, and i'd like you to use one or two policy areas as a, as examples to state your case so it could be some of those policy areas we talked about like immigration health care you know it could be something else like uh highways or rail transportation or air travel just there there are other things you can think of um, but I'd like you to talk about the current state of federalism. That's the discussion question that I'm giving you to write in your journal. It's not a discussion, it's a journal. So no discussion this week. Spend the time with the reading and uh, writing up your journal essay. And I will look forward to reading them. After this week, after unit one, we'll get more into the meat of the course um, and intergovernmental management and relations in specific areas. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing what you write.